Hi, and welcome to Poetry Passages. I'm Clifford Rames, and it is such an honor to be here today with, with George Bilger. Um, George is the author of eight poetry collections, and whew, there they are. I'm actually missing one, I'm missing the going, but I got seven. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, the newest of which is Central Air, which is hot off the presses, just released a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So you better get your hands on that because you'll be sorry if you don't. Um, George is a professor of English literature at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. He is the recipient of a number of awards, including the May Swenson Poetry Award, the 2003 Cleveland Arts Prize for Literature, and the 2009 Pushcart Prize. A poem of George's was also featured right here on Poetry Passages back in episode 77. So check that out when you get, get a chance. Um, some praise for George. Poet David Kirby says, nobody captures the sorrows and beauties of this world better than George Bilger. Dorian Locks writes, Bilger's poems paint a picture of American life that is equal parts sadness matter-of-factness, and hilarity. And former U.S. Poet, poet Laureate Billy Collins has called Bill Gare a poet who knows how to blend the sentimental and the sarcastic, the smart and the innocent, the trivial and the desperately serious. He is a welcome breath of fresh American air. <clears throat> So if I were holding my mic right now, I'd have to, I would have to drop it because- That's a drop mic. I mean, that's a drop right moment right there, George. Uh -huh. Wow. It's so wonderful that you are joining us today on the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me on, Clifford. It is such an honor to be, to be interviewed by you. And uh, anybody, anybody who gets interviewed by you is just really arrived. So it's a very- <laughs> Oh, and, thank you. And, you know, a new book comes out and it's, it's been years in the making, and you have, um, you have so much hope pinned on it that it will do well. Yeah. And when wonderful people like you turn out to help a book launch, uh, it just means so much to the author. So I thank you. You're welcome, and I really wish you all the best for the book. I'm sure it's going to do really, really well, really, really well and get many, many prizes, because <laughs> I can't put it down. Uh. Um, so you are in Cleveland, Ohio, correct? Cleveland, Ohio. You're kind of seeing a little bit out of it, of it out the window back there. It's the very beginning of spring here. Uh -huh. We're starting to feel a little bit of hope. You know, life is worth living again. <laughs> no outside without a coat on. At least the daffodils and the crocuses are doing their thing. The crocuses are coming up and the daffodils. And uh, it's just a fantastic time of year. Well, and it's also the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and and Langston Hughes went to school there, I believe, in high school. Langston Hughes went to school just just down the street from where just I down live. Down the street, not not wow. far from here. Um, it's the home of the new baseball team, which still sounds weird. The Cleveland Guardians. The Guardians, yeah. Can't, can't <laughs> just doesn't have the same flow, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's, it's muscle memory. The tongue just gets used to it. Yeah, something. yeah. I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, following baseball as a kid. So that's a fundamental change in my reality. But yeah, Cleveland is a is a great city, and it's one of it's one of those cities that's having its renaissance. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, the city is really taking off. And it's a great place to to raise yeah. kids, and it's so, also a city where normal people like uh, teachers can afford houses. You know, <laughs> yeah, which is a nice thing. And so, but you're originally from California. How, how did you end up in Cleveland? Um, just kind of the usual the usual path of uh, getting getting my degree, getting my doctorate, and teaching at various places. Mm -hmm. I taught at the University of Oklahoma. I taught in St. Louis. I taught in Denver. And I had a Fulbright in uh, Spain, in Bilbao, Spain, and got an interview uh, at John Carroll. And it turned out it was just what I was looking for. Mm. It's a kind of a small university with a thriving uh, creative writing department that that at that point was in a building mode. And they needed a poet. and. Um, 
I, I liked University of Oklahoma, but it's like 40,000 students and it's yeah. vast. And John Carroll is more like around 3,500. So uh, you, you feel like you're in a real community here. And I, I'm, I'm much more a small school guy than, you know, down the highway from here is Columbus with OSU, Oklahoma, or Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, they must have 500,000 in that school. <laughs> oh, wow. It's just a monster. So this is more, this is more yeah. in, align, in alignment with the kind of guy I am. And, and poetry, I would imagine. It's your, yeah. your students are really lucky to have you. Well, I'm lucky to have them. They have <laughs> great students. So just time to get down to the real business at hand here. I really need to know, yeah. have you visited the Christmas Story House and Museum, which is okay. right nearby on 11, West 11th Street? <laughs> yes, I have been there. I will admit, I've seen the lamp, the leg you lamp. Just, you yeah. saw the leg lamp. That's yeah. what, what, what I need to know. <laughs> I was very excited by the lamp. <laughs> the guard had to hold me back. I just wanted to grab that lamp. No, oh, you know that um, it's a major award. It's a major award. It, that uh, we we like every other Clevelander. We are you sort of required by law to watch that movie <laughs> four or five times every Christmas. So my kids demand that we see it, and and I love that film. And I don't know if if you know that the the guy who wrote it, Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard, yeah, yeah. He's, he used to have this wonderful uh, nighttime radio talk, mm -hmm. a really daring, interesting innovator in radio and in writing. And uh, that, that, uh, that movie really does capture something that's absolutely essentially true about how Cleveland looks and feels. Mm -hmm. and lives. So, yeah. yes, I've been there. Gene <laughs> Shepard, actually, he makes it a, a cameo in that movie. He's in the movie briefly. Yeah, yeah very briefly. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, when I was thinking about this question for you, I, I, one of my favorite scenes from the movie is when he has the decoder ring and he figures out that the message is really just an ad for Ovaltine. And, <laughs> and he says, a crummy commercial. And I love that word crummy. <laughs> and <laughs> it's such a great old fashioned word that nobody uses anymore. Um, but then I was going through your book and I came across the word crummy in, in the poem yeah, hardware. That's right. <laughs> I, I was like, George, word. use the word. <laughs> I may have been subconsciously influenced in that movie. And by the way, I have to mention a favorite scene of mine in that film comes right after the Ovaltine ad. You know, he's sitting on the toilet, right? Desperately opening his mail and finding you know, to buy more Ovaltine. <laughs> he's disgusted by this. And then he, he's been sitting on the toilet. He looks down and he flushes the toilet. And the next scene you see, is <laughs> the camera's pointing into his mom's chili. Yes. <laughs> it's beautiful, ca beautiful camera work uh, beautiful. transition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do use the word crummy. Have your boys um, picked up on that word yet? Yeah, my my boys. I, crummy is not a word anyone seems to be using. <laughs> no, it's too bad. <laughs> so I'm um, getting back to your book. Um, it has such a great title, Central Air, and I was just kind of wondering what made you choose it. I know there's a poem in the book called Central Air, but why did you select yeah, that well, particular title? Um, <clears throat> And the poem, I, I like the I like the poem, but I don't think it's it's one of the, the big poems in the book or one of the poems mm -hmm. that I think cast the widest net. But the title seemed just right for the book. Um, first of all, this idea that you know the, the the poem talks about the fact that people who have central air in their homes are kind of deleting nature from their lives. You know, you don't hear the crickets, you don't feel the humidity, you're, you're locking the summer out so you can live in this frigid little chamber. But now that's on a literal level. And, and, and in some ways the book touches on vaguely on themes of climate change and global warming, not, not very overtly. But more than that, I like the sound of the phrase central air like um when you 
read, when you speak, when you read a poem, you create vibrations in the air and the air is suddenly full of your poem. And maybe it's a kind of faux boastful way of saying, hey, the, the hot air in my poems is pretty central. So, or at least I'd like it to be. So, you know, it's just one of those phrases that resonated yeah. with me in strange ways. And then, so years ago, about 10 or a dozen years ago, my wife and I went to a, an art uh, exhibit in Cleveland and we saw a, a series of paintings by a young woman painter named Amy Casey. And she does Cleveland houses in all kinds of crazy ways. Like the exhibit we saw all these Cleveland sort of bland frame, wooden frame suburban houses were drifting in the air, oh, wow. connected, supported by uh, power lines and phone lines. And it had something to do with a kind of, I don't know, dis, a, a sense of disconnection perhaps we're all feeling. I was really moved by her work. So uh, I was kicking around some ideas for the title and I was thinking about central air. And then I thought, I'm gonna do an image search for Amy Casey and see what she's got. And almost immediately, this image, that's kind of a fish lens view mm -hmm. of houses in a city. Um, it's, very, it's very striking. And I saw that image and I thought, that is perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Please God, let that image be available. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, I looked her up and I emailed her and I said, I'm absolutely in love with this painting of yours. May I use it? And she very graciously said, yes. So that's how it worked out. Wow. Yeah. It is a great, it is a great image. Fisheye. Um, well, I read, I read the whole book and I've been going back and forth into it, as you can see. And every poem is a keeper. I have to tell you, um, and I found it impossible just to select the few that I wanted to do today. So I think what I'm going to do is just sort of sit back and let you read the whole book. Huh? And okay, I'll just read the whole book. <laughs> sort of a poetry filibuster. Right, here we go. Let <laughs> me take a few hours, folks. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, yeah. Um, but seriously, if you had to choose um, just one poem from the book um, that basically says, this is George Bilger, the poet, this is who I am. Um, I know it's a tough question, and, but what do you think it would be? Uh, um, one poem that sort of represents where I am as, as a writer uh, right now, I would say it is a poem called Reichstag, you know, the famous old building in Berlin, Germany, the capital of, capital of Germany. My wife and, and two little boys and I, every summer we spend in Germany. Um, and it's one of the one of the perks of being a teacher. You get the summers off, so we always stay in the same flat. And Berlin is where I do almost all my writing. I've got three months, and every morning I go to a favorite cafe in a charming little neighborhood, about half a mile from the apartment, and I spend the morning there working on poems. And uh, I, the last three or four of my books have basically all been written in this apartment, I mean, in this, uh, this little cafe. And so this poem, Reichstag, which I, I'll, I'll read to you now, it, um, it embodies a few of the things that are happening in my life now, both as I'm a dad, I have a, I have a couple of kids. Uh, I spend the summers in Germany because I find that somehow you, my usual subject is in one way or another America. It's craziness, it's pop culture, it's politics, it's, it's wild volatility. And somehow I can see all of that more clearly from the distance of Berlin. And the poem is both deeply serious, but funny, which I think my, my poems at their best are. That doesn't always work, but when it does work, those are my best poems, I think. And then finally, there's a huge historical backdrop, the, the tragic history of Berlin and the Holocaust and everything else that has happened in that city. And then in the foreground, there's the tiny human drama of me and my little boy going one day to look at the Reichstag. So 
Uh, I think that's probably the, the representative poem in the collection. Great. Uh, so for anybody who wants to follow along, it's on page 47. Page 47, yeah. Reichstag. My little boy and I are standing in front of the Reichstag, which is burning and coalescing with rich and complicated history right there in front of us. But he doesn't particularly care. In fact, he's not even looking at the damn thing, having focused all his attention instead on a tiny, intricately tattooed black and red beetle at his feet. A firebug, he says. And I know he's right because <clears throat> we looked it up online last week. You see them all the time here in Berlin, or at least he does. And there's really nothing more exciting for him, at least at the moment, than to see a firebug moving through the grass. And I know that the firebug era will soon come to an end to be replaced by the getting stoned and drunk and calling me from jail era <clears throat> to be followed by the buying his first condom era, which in time will lead to the moving into his own place era, which I fear because my own ice age is not that far off and I will not roam the earth much longer, huge and carnivorous and terrifying, frightening smaller creatures with my roar, lowering my great bulk to kneel alongside a small boy to watch the firebug inscribed with its ancient and inscrutable hieroglyphics crawl past us in front of some old building. Thank you. So, so many of your poems are um, infused with and address kind of a growing awareness of your your own mortality, especially yeah. in relation to your children. And I'm not a parent myself other than to my two dogs. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, how, how does becoming a parent change your awareness of the passage of time and uh, put it in yeah. a different context? Uh, perhaps making you more conscious of how much time you have left to hold on to the things that are dear to you. I like to say that having children keeps you old. <laughs> it doesn't keep you young, believe me. Whoever said that got it all wrong. She's <laughs> really old. Um, yeah, of course. Um, I, I had, you know, I'm like the world's oldest, fairly new dad. And uh, it, it, imparts a kind of urgency to my writing and, and to my living now that I certainly wouldn't have if I didn't have these two little boys. Um, you are so acutely aware as any parent can tell you that their childhood goes rushing past and you feel you just have to stand and pay close and intense uh, scrutiny to this beautiful wonderful but very fleeting thing that's happening in front of your eyes so yeah I'm, I'm really aware of it and um you know i think of the uh, andrew marvell poem to his coy mis mistress you know he's wooing this woman he wants to sleep with and he said had we but world enough in time this coyness mistress would be no crime but at my back i always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near and I have never heard that chariot hurrying any nearer or faster <laughs> than I have since I had these kids. Since you have kids. So yeah, it, it really underlined <laughs> the whole life process. Reminds me of something I heard um, Bruce Springsteen say once. He said, you know, I would have never imagined this when I was a young, young rock and roller, but here I am now older and as a parent and I know that as a parent into my 90 into my 90s i'm going to be chasing my kids down the street saying be careful be careful don't do that don't do that <laughs> absolutely i'm sure I mean, that you never it never leaves you right they were always they will always be my little boys no matter how old, how will they how right. they betray me by growing up <laughs> so but, a, a wonderful a wonderful example of of what we're talking about is found in your poem the scar um, and it got me thinking about um, scars and how 
how they are sort of silent witnesses to his story, you know, always hinting at but never fully telling a tale yeah. um, of the violence that caused the scar to begin with. Um, but it's also a uniquely personal and um, intimate bond that connects us to the world and to the people who were there yes. when we got injured and got the scar, who were trying to comfort us. Yeah. Um, this poem, the scar. Do you think that? I mean, is there some truth in what I'm saying? And and that and is, is that a right lead into this poem? No, that I mean, what what you say about the scar and the way it connects us to the people who were around us when when we were scarred, when right. life when life literally scarred us. Yeah, yeah, that's that's profound, uh, much more powerful than any tattoo you can ever get. Right. Yeah. Um, well, um, would you be able to read the scar for I us? Will, I'll read it to you. Um, it's it, on page 16 for anybody. It's on page 16, and there's one. Uh, it takes place at one of my favorite places in Cleveland, our local public pool. You know, you, you can't have a city without your local public pool because okay. to me, those places are sacred. It's where everyone in our, in our little township gathers on these beastly hot summer days. And I always think of it as a kind of affirmation of life, a celebration of baptism. Everybody in the neighborhood gets in the water together and yeah. all people are joyous around water. And we have, yeah, we've had so much fun in our public pool. I have to say there's one, uh, one word I use in the poem, Phidian, uh, from the Greek poet, Phidias, not poet, he was a sculptor, mm -hmm. and he was noted for the, the, the great delicacy and beauty of his sculptors, especially heads. heads yeah. So the poem is called The Scar. My son slipped on the ladder to the pool and smacked his head, blood calling on his small shoulders the doctor stitching him whole. Three years on, after a haircut, the scar still rises. A quarter moon, a woman will ask about as they lie there one night, her fingers in his hair, her voice in his ear. The secret delight of him, a bit like burnt toast in her nostrils, as she takes his strangeness into her. What she won't know is how the frail, Phidian skull I held that day in my hands resounded on the hot concrete. It echoed all summer, less like an egg cracking in a bowl or a world breaking than the wild beating of love against my heart. Dear girl who will one day win him, that part of the boy is mine. Wow. Thank you. It's wonderful. Um, not a poem you could have written as a, as a childless poet, right? No, no. <laughs> and, and I think probably a lot, of, a lot of writers, a lot of male writers and, and women writers as well probably think, I wonder if having children will curtail the kind of freedom and openness I had in life before I had kids, but no, quite the opposite. I think it opens up whole new fields of, of poetic exploration. Yeah. Feeling. Were you in a, in a barber shop when you wrote this? Or? <laughs> no, but Michael just got his haircut two weeks ago and it, it happened again, right back it's, here. It's still there. Yeah. When he gets the back cut, you know, kind of a buzz cut in the back, mm -hmm. there's that little scar where the wow. hair never quite grew in properly. And the moment I see it, he gets back from the barber shop with the required Tootsie Roll for me from the barber. And there it is again. And that instant when he fell and hit his head comes rushing back, even though it was years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. My mother, I have a burn it's hard to see but there's a burn here in my hand i was like two years old and for some ungodly reason i don't know why nobody knows why i stuck my hand in the oven oh. and my, my hand kind of literally stuck to the side of the oven my mother also often recounts the story of how she came racing oh into the kitchen kitchen to yank me out of the oven yeah, <laughs> it, somehow, it, 
Somehow, it's, Clifford, we our kids survived this. We survived it. Yeah. And I, mean, can. I don't I, remember I, it at all. I don't remember it at all. But the scar is there, and my mother knows the story, which is that again, that that connection we talked about. Yeah, um, yeah your, your poems are so so very personal and almost confessional and heartfelt and so fascinating. Uh, it's sort of balancing act between, like you said earlier, there's always a sort of balance between melancholy and mirth and profound sadness and knee slapping satire and lamentations and cheeky observations. Um, when reading them, I often feel like I'm, I'm in a bumper car, <laughs> kind of one minute recoiling from the, the pain of a blow and the next uh, laughing and exhilaration. Um, there's always this kind of wonderful element of surprise. Do you yeah. as a poet sometimes surprise yourself? Um, and is there, are there any secrets that you can reveal about how you oh manage, to, manage to pull these magic rabbits out of the hat? Secret to being surprising. I, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's a secret. I, I know that, um, I think I can sense when the poem is in danger of veering precipitously into the sentimental. Mm -hmm. And when I see that start to happen, I want to give it a hard right turn right out of there and ambush the reader with some crazy observation or unexpected phrase. Uh, I, I want to be surprised as a reader. I, I want to be delighted. Um, I don't, I don't want readers to be complacent when they read my, when they th say, oh, this will just be a nice, charming poem about how much he loves his son. Uh, I, I, I want the reader to be anxious. I want them to be looking around a little bit like they're in a haunted house. You know, <laughs> anything could happen. And I think just looking for the opportunity for the unexpected, for the surprise mm -hmm. insight and bringing those two elements together, the serious and the comic, clashing into each other can, uh, can result in some really great things. Yeah, but yeah. doesn't always. I have a poem uh, in my, my last book about being in the, in the birthing room when, mm -hmm. when my second son was born and what that's like. Yeah, yeah. And that is a poem, uh, that is an opportunity ripe with cliche and sentimentality and the miraculous beauty of birth and all that stuff. And so I'm thinking, I have to write about this because it, it was such a great moment in my life, but I don't want to do the, the miraculous sacred beauty of life thing. So what I did was, as, as I'm watching the miraculous beauty of the birth, I was also aware that the nurse and the anesthesiologist they're totally bored by this. It means <laughs> nothing to them. They've seen Just another one. Yeah. They're talking about his lousy dating life. He's not <laughs> getting anywhere with this woman he's going after. As the central miracle of all humanity, the birth of my child is happening. And it was, I, I, I couldn't focus on it at the time, but even then I was thinking, this is hysterically funny. And so that's the kind of thing I'm always looking for. Two things that don't go together at all, yeah. and you kind of jam them together. And life is full of those moments. I mean, we're, yeah. all, we're all sort of sort of self-important, and we think, you know. Exactly. It's all happening around us. But meanwhile, you stop and you listen, and you realize every, everyone's just doing their thing. And there's... Like yeah, I am, not, I am not the central player in your life. <laughs> Well, for me, um, there's a poem called I Heard a Fly Buzz in the book, um, which really kind of for me represents what we're talking about and kind of yeah. style, you know, beautifully weaving together all those elements with um, poignant glimpses of your family and that ever foreboding sense of your own mortality. Um, am I close to? to yeah, 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 exactly. And there's a, the title, uh, of course, if, if you're an English major, the title, I Heard a Fly Buzz, is a famous Emily Dickinson poem in which she imagines lying on her deathbed in her bedroom, mm -hmm. surrounded by loved ones, and her last perception of the world before consciousness blinks out is this fade to darkness. And it's an eerie, chilling poem. So I, I stole her title. 
<laughs> there's another one in the book too that you miss play off of emily dickinson there story. is another one that that yeah. poem uh, because i could not stop for death yeah, yeah. So, oh, would you would you read um i heard a fly yeah. buzz for us i heard i heard a fly buzz and that's on oh that's yeah 56 56 i stumbled into the kitchen got the coffee maker started did the dishes from last night and then you came down in your robe, wondering why I was up so early. And I realized I'd misread the clock. I'd actually gotten up at seven, not eight. And suddenly I had a whole hour bestowed upon me by the gods who dole out our span of time. And this was long ago, years ago, but I still have that hour. I've guarded it zealously. And when the time comes and the darkness is closing in, and perhaps I even hear a fly buzz, I'll take out that hour from the secret place where I keep it. I'll show it to all of you gathered around my bedside and I'll cry out, look, another hour. And that fly will pause in its goddamn buzzing and all of you, and that means you, Michael and Alex, all of you will be forced to smile and say, really, that's uh, just awesome. And I shall continue with my reminiscences. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> they better listen. They better listen. um so there there are two other um important subjects of your poems that i haven't touched upon yet and um and those are your mother and father and and they always kind of weave throughout your books thank Um, you uh and parent we we all know the parent and offspring relationships are often very tricky things (laughs) um but can you tell us a little about your parents, um, yeah. and 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 because you know, they are such an inherent part of your of your work, yeah. they are. Uh, my parents' story. Um, my my father, I, I have written a, I have written their story and rewritten it and rewritten it over and over again. I feel like that's what I do as a writer: tell my parents' story. My mother um, was a nurse uh, in a tuberculosis sanatorium. And my father, as a young man in his, in his teens and then his 20s, was a very promising uh, classical singer. He was a tenor, uh, a singer of leader and oratorio. He went to New York to study voice and was planning a career as a singer, but he got TB in his mid-20s and he lost a lung. So it was one of the, it was just a classic story uh, of an artist who, whose gift has been stolen from him. And his father was this kind of larger than life figure who uh, early in the 20th century uh, traveled all over America, started a farm implements company in St. Louis, which became a Ford dealership, which during World World War II retooled to make tank engines and emerged as a Chevrolet dealership. It was the biggest Chevy dealership in St. Louis. And my father, now without a lung and no prospects, he went to work for his father, my grandfather, and my dad became the president of Bill Gare Chevrolet. The last thing he ever saw happening to him. And he was very unhappy in that role. And he began to drink and he became a heroic drinker. And I I remember him as a man uh, struggling with a terrible drinking problem, which finally killed him or he killed himself with this problem. He died when he was 45. So my whole childhood had this kind of operatic, dramatic, tragic quality. Mm. I, at readings, I, I kid around, maybe it's not that funny, but I say to, I say to parents at my readings, um, you know, if you, if you want your kids to grow up to be poets, just become an alcoholic, because that is one way they, 
that is a legacy that they will mm. spend a lifetime uh, trying to figure out. So I have told this story over and over again. When my, and when my father lost a lung, he went to a sanatorium in St. Louis and met my mother. They got married. And then, and then the whole, the kids came and here I am. So that's, that's the story of my parents. Uh, my mom was from a farm in Illinois. She was just a farm girl who found herself married to this first singer, then rather one-time singer, now rather wealthy car dealership owner, living in a fancy house in St. Louis. And for a while, they had it all. And then the whole thing just blew to pieces and that's a story that in one way or another, I, I keep on telling. Mm. I mean, I think if you were from a, if there is such a thing as a happy childhood, I think it would be pretty hard to make a career in writing out of that. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me back when I was in college and, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a writer and I was scribbling away and turning in these works of creative writing to my professor and um, Dr. Tatara at one point wasn't so impressed with my work. And I kept saying, why, why, what's wrong with it? He goes, finally, he said, all right, I'm going to confess to you. You're a great, you're a good writer. Keep at it. But the one thing that's missing through all of your work is the pain of life. Oh. And, and, what a great <laughs> and he was so right because I was like, no, 19 years old or 20 yeah. years old. And I didn't know anything yet and hadn't experienced any. Yeah. Any, that's great. You were too yeah. happy too happy yet to be a writer so oh. thank you for sharing that story about your parents and um it got me thinking that you know and i talked a little bit about this with with dorian locks also in a previous interview about how poetry is such a way wonderful way for us to deal with with grief and mm -hmm. it's almost cathartic and um, Absolutely. yeah and i was just wondering you know you kind of touched upon it but your own journey through through loss and no, your own journey through poetry to negotiate with the pain of loss. Um, if you could talk about that a little bit, yeah. I mean, when did you when did you become aware that that you know these subjects needed well, to be in words? Yeah. yeah. In a way, it's uh, in a way I feel guilty about it, uh, honestly, because um, I discovered, you know, I was I was a young writer uh, in my I was in a writing workshop, a program at Washington University in St. Louis. I was beginning to make my way as a writer. Of course, in my mid twenties, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what my subject was, what my voice was. I'm going through the usual confusion and kind of, you know, blind groping of, of the young writer. And then I, I wrote a poem about um, my father and, and his drinking. And I, I had never written a deeply personal poem before. I, you know, I, I praised birds and trees. I described the weather. I had done the things that young poets do. I wrote this poem uh, about my dad coming home blind drunk one night and, and how that was like a, like a thunderstorm entering our house. And I was about 26 or 27. And I, I typed it up on my typewriter and I looked at it and I, I realized that was the first real poem I had ever written, that everything else had been a kind of practice, a kind of exercise. And this poem kind of quivered with an authentic life of its own. It wasn't an imitation of T.S. Eliot or W.B. Yeats. Um, it wasn't uh, a, a, a mere workshop exercise, you know, use 10 metaphors in 20 lines. Uh, it was a poem that came right out of my heart and had this unmistakable stamp of authenticity, mm -hmm. of lived life. And, and I realized that my parents' tragedy was in a way, my, my destiny was to was to be to, to write about that. And so in some ways I have, uh, I have felt a little bit opportunistic about that, you know, like, are they thinking in their graves, look, would you just leave us alone? But that has been my, my real uh, subject as, as a poet 
and I go back to that mine over and over again. And I guess maybe maybe most writers have one place they return to. Um, but that that kind of central drama and tragedy of my life is what made me a writer. Yeah. It's your it's your you're giving voice to your scar. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Um, well, um, about your mother, and I just there's a poem in here called Anna Karina. Um, which I would love for you to read for us because your mother's in it. And uh, we can talk about it afterwards so we don't give anything away, but it's such, okay. a, such, a, such a beautiful poem. It's on right. page, page eight for those following along. My mother was a nurse. Anna Karenina. My mother was long dead before I was old enough to ask her who she was. But I'm reading Anna Karenina, which I recall her burning through late nights after a double shift, after the insertion of suppositories and the emptying of bedpans, after she fried us up some pork chops and opened a can of applesauce and a can of hominy and a can of fruit cocktail. She'd sit down with her cigarettes and red wine and read these big novels that took her away from thinking all day about money and into whatever Emma Bovary or Eleanor Dashwood was dealing with. She disappeared into French winters. She walked down London streets or sat quietly with Anna in her parlor. I look around in the novel for her cigarettes tonight, her glass of wine, anything she might have left behind. Mm. Wow. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, thank you, Clifford. That that was really a strange, you know, I had, all of us have our, our, uh, our guilty list of great books mm -hmm. we haven't read, right? It thinks you're you're not supposed to admit to, like uh, Moby Dick, for that's, instance. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I I that's I'm, I'm going to get to it one of these days. <laughs> well, I had you know I had gone through my entire life. There I am in my you know my mid sixties, and I had never read Anna Karenina, wow. and I'd heard about it since I was a, a college kid. But I do remember my mother reading that and various other, she, like, like a lot of intelligent young people from the farm, from the country, you know, way back in the 30s and 40s, she wanted to improve herself. And so she, she would get the great classics and read them. And so I remember my mother sitting in our den with Anna Karenina, her glass of wine, cigarette, late at night, going through these novels. So just a few years ago, I picked up Anna Karenina and I read it. Of course, it's an astounding novel. But what was strange was thinking, my mother took this journey. My mother, my mother was here. My mother was in this room. My mother was at this train yard. She was in this cafe. You know what I mean? It's kind of an eerie feeling. And I felt almost like she was right there with me and I could reach out and say, oh my God, isn't this a great scene? And uh, so I felt, I felt her living presence as I read through that, that marvelous novel. It's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story. It's incredible. Um, do you remember any of your mother's other favorite big novels? Yeah, I do. She um, she read Anna Karenina. She, yes, she read War and Peace, um, and then she she got on a, uh, a Victorian novel kick <laughs> with um, Jane Austen. She devoured Jane Austen, and I th I think in part that was because she briefly had a life full of of money and a certain kind of glamour. Yeah. When my father died, the money was gone, single mom raising three kids, living in a, and here's that word, crummy, living in a crummy little 
three bedroom house in a cheap subdivision of Riverside, California. No glamour, just that were a word I hate, just coping, trying to make ends meet. So it was easy to understand why living in the world of Jane Austen, these wealthy people without a care in the world other than which millionaire shall I marry? Um, Jane Austen, were, that, that was her soap opera world. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a, a great big uh, Charles Dickens rush through these massive things. So, wow. wow. Very cool. It's a classic tale of, like, you know, of the unlived dreams of uh, the shattered dreams that you know, we never yeah, achieved. Right. And you grow old, and the grow older you get, the more out of reach they become. Exactly. It's wow. So one of the one of the poems that I find myself going back to over and over again, and I'm not sure if it's the one you were talking about earlier, but um, it's the one called "Last Night," and it's a scene in a St. Louis motel room. It's just you and your father. Um, And the poem reminded me of a quote, believe it or not, from Kurt Vonnegut. And Vonnegut said that he wrote, where is home? I've wondered where home is. And I realized it's not Mars or someplace like that. It's Indianapolis when I was nine years old. (laughs) I I had a brother and a sister, a cat, and a dog, a mother and a father, and uncles and aunts. And there's no way I can get there again. Oh my God, that kills me. Yeah, and so between that quote and this poem, you know, I'm probably gonna lose it, but um, (laughs) is there there a place or time um, from your childhood that that you'd want to go back to again, um, or at least explore more in your poetry? Um, For us, for my family, uh, when, when we were all together, there were moments when we were all together in St. Louis, when there was a mother and a father and three kids yeah. and aunts and uncles that was very special, but it didn't last long when mm-hmm. my dad's drinking became uncontrollable. But my mom moved the whole family from St. Louis to Riverside, California, where she had been, my mother was a military nurse, and when she was coming back from, uh, from the war, de- being demobilized, she went, that, that happened in LA. And while she was in LA, she visited Riverside and thought it was the most beautiful place she'd ever seen. It was, at that time, it was a little town nestled in a valley surrounded with orange groves, it smelled like orange blossoms. And it always occupied a kind of special place in her imagination. So we moved out there and we got this little cheap little house and you're a kid. You don't really care about stuff like that. You don't really notice it. It was a nice neighborhood. We had friends, uh, my mother and my two sisters and I, and we had an uncle who lived out there and Kurt Vonnegut's home was Indiana, Indianapolis when he was nine. I would say my home was Riverside, California when I was 12, 13, we, we had some real happy years there where we yeah. were a family without these terrible problems. We didn't have any money, but there was a real happiness. And, and my mother was fulfilled. You know, she, she found that she could do anything. What's your, let me ask you, what's yours? Um, probably around the same time, nine, 10 years old, Lakewood, New Jersey, which is where I lived prior to us moving to the house that I lived in until I moved out. Um, It was just, my dad was just kind of getting on his feet. He had just opened up his own business. Things were starting to go well. Now I got a new bicycle and I had good friends and we had like, you know, the block was full of kids that we all knew and played with each other. And, (laughs) and there was a woods um, that we would go exploring in and build forts in and, and, it was like this pine forest and there's there was this water treatment plant that flushed out all this water and created like this giant canal and we would jump our bikes over the canal thinking we were evil Knievel and that to me was you know, it was being a kid in Americana you know and and it, I, th- that sort of sense of being a kid in Americana was sure. never never captured again after that and we started this interview by talking about a Christmas story isn't that exactly what that is yeah, yeah. exactly 
it's what resonates yeah so yeah. much in that movie for i think for so many people why it's so popular yeah. um so last night would you be able to read that for us um it's yes, on page 14 and this poem so my dad um because of these drinking bouts, my dad spent a lot of time in the doghouse, thrown out. And uh, there was a hotel in uh, St. Louis called uh, the Coronado Hotel, where he would always go. In fact, he'd try to stay in the same room. And I spent many a night there with him. We'd watch TV and kind of hang out like outlaws. And uh, I was about nine hmm. and no, 10, I was 10. I had just turned 10 when this poem was written because I, I say that at the beginning of the poem. Um, so here's the poem, last night. I am 10 with my father in a St. Louis hotel. It is late, the TV, a black and white campfire. The marriage has been pronounced dead. He says to the phone, a bottle of scotch and a setup, where are my mother and sisters? There is just the one lamp on the table and a camel fumes in its ashes. Daddy's a few months from that photo of the wake and more flowers than I'd ever seen. He lifts the tumbler, ice clinks immensely, the last one, he says to me, this is the last one. I promise you the sweat on his forehead. And tonight is the last time I will see him, which in a strange way, I think, explains my sense of humor, which friends have described as quirky and unpredictable. He, yeah, he went into shock from alcohol poisoning, was taken to the hospital, and never recovered. So. And he also smoked with one lung, which was also another recipe for disaster. What else can you do wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That camel burning in the ashtray, it's such, a, such an image. Um, my dad is a Pall Mall man. Um, <laughs> no filter. <laughs> um, and speaking of Pall Mall men, uh, Kurt Vonnegut was a Pall Mall man also. And he said, another thing that Kurt Vonnegut said, he said, whenever he wrote, uh, he wrote as if he were writing to his dead beloved sister, Alice. Right. And it got me wondering if there's anyone um, in particular that you write for or sort of, you know, sort of speak to someone off screen through your verses. There is, yeah, uh, absolutely. And that person is my aunt, mm -hmm. <coughs> Betty. Aunt Betty. She passed away about eight years ago. She was my father's sister. Um, a couple of my books are dedicated to her, and I have several poems that I have written about Betty. She uh, was a wonderful woman, a tall, elegant, brilliant, college-educated woman, uh, a feminist uh, long before the, the term had even been uh, invented. And just a brilliant free thinker who loved poetry and more than anyone else in my life encouraged me in this, this dream of becoming a writer. She stood behind me and beside me and uh, helped me realize this, this dream. There, there were certainly times when I thought this is ridiculous. And she, uh, she inspired me. She was the one who said, when I was 30 years old uh, and I had never been to Europe, she said, this is ridiculous. This is unacceptable. We are going to London. And she took me, we, we traveled to London together, uh, spent two weeks tromping through the streets of London, going to museums, going to shows, walking through the parks. And it changed my life. It completely changed my life, uh, learning about Europe and realizing all of this is there. So uh, she was also a great lover of poetry. She had a master's degree in English literature from uh, uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder and um, could recite 
massive swaths of Wordsworth and Keats and, really? and often did. <laughs> wow, awesome. <laughs> yeah, everyone needs an Aunt Betty. Every writer needs an Aunt Betty in their lives. And well, if, if we were drinking right now, it would be a time to toast Aunt Betty. Yeah. Um, and Aunt Betty, I mean, these names too, just to get back to that sort of nostalgia for the past. I mean, there's some names too, like Betty. My grandmother was Claire. I had an Aunt, yeah. Gertie, Aunt Gertie. These are some names that are just kind of fading away which is a pity because they're maureen my mother's name is maureen which is also kind of a name you don't hear too often anymore when when did you last meet a betty right right when did you last meet a betty not too many georges either no not many georges anymore um my best friend's name is george so there you'll be you'll be (laughs) thrilled um so i you know i've kept you for a while now but i wanted to um i would love for you to read uh, one more poem, um, and it's a fun one. Yeah, it's, it's one I actually heard Billy Collins read recently, but I would love to hear it in George Bilger's voice. And oh. it's the one on page thirty-two called German. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about it after you read. All it. right, I will read this poem. And uh, <laughs> as I said, we we unless there's a pregnancy or a plague, we are usually in Berlin in the summers. And one of, well, the the poem speaks to this. I don't need to say anything. The poem is called German. I stroll through Berlin, not knowing German. The level at which I don't know German is amazing. It's like, I'm here and it's over there. And this, I'm proud to say, is after years of study, high school, college. I have not learned German at some of the best schools in the country. I make not knowing German look effortless. People, experts, listen to me not speaking or understanding German in wonder. To tell the truth, I'm glad I don't speak German. I have better things to do with my time. Plus, if I actually spoke German, which I have no interest in doing, I'd probably just end up saying the same things I already say in English, like, have you seen my keys? Let's do Chinese tonight, etc. So what's the point? Therefore, if you don't mind, I'll just keep on not knowing German. And if learning German is such a big deal to you, by all means, go ahead and learn it. Be my guest. Just don't expect me to understand a word you're saying. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> just told me. But come on, you must you must know a couple of curse words because it's always always the first thing you learn. <laughs> I, I know some curse words. I'm very good. I'm very good at ordering beer, uh, <laughs> which is easy beer. <laughs> easy, but really, once once you delve into German, I mean, it's just. <laughs> makes me bonkers. It's a great failure of my life. (laughs) And my my grandmother spoke German. She spoke German to me. I should speak German. Junior high school, high school, college, language classes. It's it's hopeless. (laughs) (laughs) It's like one of those languages where you can create new words just by adding words onto the end. Stack them all up together. Yeah, yeah, create a word that's like that long and utterly (laughs) unpronounceable. it's a wonderful language not to speak. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think you mentioned uh, Betty turning Aunt Betty turning you on to your European things, and I was wondering about Berlin and your relationship with Germany, and and how did how did that tradition start with you going to Germany every summer? Well, it started uh, really in a sense with with Billy Collins. There was a uh, international. My wife and I were traveling around Europe, and visiting friends of hers and her friends kept talking that we were in Utrecht and her friend kept, had just been to Germany, kept raving about Germany. And Billy Collins and I are old pals. And I knew he was going there for this international poetry conference. Mm -hmm. So we all decided to to connect in Germany. Uh, Billy with his then girlfriend, now wife, Susie, and me with my wife. And, uh, we spent a few days there together 
And the weather was horrible. It was pouring rain. Berlin is, honestly, it's kind of ugly, kind of still bombed out looking. You know, Billy did not like it. Uh, it. You know, he said, couldn't we be in the sun, you know, in Rome or something, sitting <laughs> at a cafe drinking wine? Uh, and so they left. And the moment they left, the sun came out. Oh, it's no. gloriously beautiful. And we saw a, a, a part of Berlin that was a little bit like the old cabaret Berlin of the 20s. All of this life and culture and excitement and fun, he never saw any of it. it just poured so, out into the street. Huh? Yeah. So we, we were crazy about it. We stayed another week. And then we came back the next summer and our, our love of the place just kept growing. We love the idea of taking our kids there. And as we say, I mean, when we're in Berlin, we, we travel to some other cities, Stockholm and Rome and Paris, you know, the, the European must sees. What we say is we want our kids to be fluent in Europe. Uh, to, to, for them to understand, they can, they can travel, they can go anywhere they want, you know. There's more to life than Cleveland, right. Ohio, hard as that may be to believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you ever decide to take a, a, a side trip down to um, Croatia, I'm your man because I have a, your, your Germany, what Germany is to you, Croatia is to me. I spend a lot then of time. I will talk to you about it because we have talked about that. Yeah. And my wife has a, a close college friend who is Croatian. <gasps> okay. I forget where she lives there, but, she, but it's supposed to be just incredibly. It beautiful. is. It's incredibly yes. beautiful. And, and um, yeah, my dad's from there. My mom's kind of this German Irish girl from Manhattan. And my dad is from, from Croatia. And wow. so, uh, interesting mix. Um, but yeah, let me know if you ever want to go. I'll pick you free, really. <laughs> you, you Feel free. Okay, so to wrap up, I guess, um, not that we're in any hurry, but um, I wanted to mention that George also hosts a wonderful podcast called Wordplay. It's a sort of spoken word radio program on WJCU that has been called the car talk of poetry. <laughs> so do you want to... Do you want to take a moment to kind of plug it and tell yeah, us? I, I, let me plug the show because I think anyone uh, would listening might, who likes poetry would get a kick out of it. It's a show I've been doing for about a dozen years or more with a dear friend, my radio co-host, John Donahue, former electrical engineer professor. Uh, so he has sort of both sides of his brain working. And um, John and I are... As, as you might guess, we're, we're uh, omnivorous devourers of poetry. So we, we find the poems we like most out there in the culture, whoever is writing uh, poems that we consider, this is our phrase, radio ready, a poem you can hear on the radio and enjoy. You know, you're not going to tune into wordplay and hear uh, the wasteland <laughs> read aloud. Um, it's, it's contemporary, mostly American poets who are writing poems. And we lean kind of toward the humorous poetry thing, but uh, we have a wonderful rapport. Uh, we read a poem, we chat about it, we read another poem. And if you want to hear the show at Eastern Standard Time, it's on Fridays at 6. And if you go to wjcu.com, org and just push listen listen and you, that you'll be able to hear the show you can also hear it saturday mornings at 8 30 in the morning and yeah you'll you'll really get a kick out of it and i'm thinking you know the show reaches all of cleveland and in a strange way i god i wish i wish it were a nationally broadcast show because um the Writer's Almanac, Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac, left NPR and became a podcast, and it is going away soon. So the idea of, uh, you know, there's no medium that is better suited to poetry than radio. I just think it's the perfect thing for poetry. So I hope, uh, I hope some people watching this show, this interview, will tune into Wordplay. Give it a try. Yeah, I mean, I'm so so thrilled that you're doing this. I mean, like you said, the poetry and radio, they, they seem to go together. And you know, we talked earlier about Gene Shepard and his old radio shows, yeah. which led to A Christmas Story. And 
and this whole podcast boom i think is, is a good thing yeah. people gather around too. their radios again <laughs> yeah. isn't that nice yeah, yeah so i will put the links up um at the end of the video so you can find them um and just one last question just sort of logistically is there a tour a book tour planned any live event live reading events that people should watch out for yeah there there have been uh, i'll be putting this up on my uh my website, which is just georgebilgear.com. There have been, the book came out really two weeks ago. Um, I've, I've done a reading at, at uh, Case Western Reserve University here in Cleveland. I was just in Pittsburgh uh, this past weekend at a wonderful place called the White Whale Bookstore. On uh, this coming Wednesday, I'll be at I'll be in Corpus Christi, Texas, doing a couple of readings. One is at Del Mar College, and um, further events are 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 being planned and unfolding. You know, Clifford, uh, all of us in the in the kind of poetry touring biz have been grounded for two yeah, years. I know. The the reading I gave at uh, Case Western University last week was the first reading I'd given in two years. Wow. And so we're all, we're all kind of moving yeah. cautiously back mm -hmm. in the world. So it's, it's happening slowly, but it's happening. Yeah. Well, personally, I hope you one day make it out to the, out to the East Coast. I, will oh, I hope you be back there. Princeton or New York City, someplace. Freehold, New Jersey. <laughs> I, would, I would accept Princeton, I guess, Prince maybe. <laughs> was right <laughs> well that kind of does it for us um, i hope everyone um enjoyed this interview with the great george pilgare well, i um, certainly enjoyed it and a, a chance to get to know you a little bit clifford i well, hope we can meet up in real life and toast and betty toast and betty it's mandatory yes i hope so too um so thank you again george and thanks to everyone out there for watching we hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned for more and we'll see you again real soon right here on Poetry Passages. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Clifford. You're welcome, George. Thank you.